Sebastian Vettel's championship hopes are hanging by a thread after another disastrous race for Ferrari at the Japanese Grand Prix. Lewis Hamilton can make it a done deal if he outscores Vettel by at least eight points at the next race in the United States. It seems hard to believe that Vettel led the championship after winning the British Grand Prix at Silverstone in July, but Ferrari's season has spectacularly unravelled since the summer. And there was more woe in Japan. A strategic blunder in qualifying that put both cars on the wrong tyre at the wrong time, difficulty making the tyres last through the stints in the race, and another costly wheel-to-wheel uh, -wheel clash for Vettel in a season littered with costly wheel-to-wheel -wheel clashes. Joining me to discuss uh, the latest round in Ferrari's implosion this season are Andrew van der Berg and Stuart Codling. So gents, why, why has Ferrari so spectacularly gone off the boil since the summer? It, it, it could just be a coincidence, but isn't it strange that the worst of it has happened after the unfortunate death of Sergio Marchione. It's after Monza that it really, really has gone from bad to worse to even worse to double implosion. I think it's important to understand the, uh, the element of momentum that plays out in this and the way that pressure is then exerted. So I think it all comes back to that tiny mistake with the enormous consequences that Vettel made in Hockenheim and going off and costing them the win. Because if he'd won that race and Hamilton was on the back foot, then the, the pressure goes right to the other side. All the pressure goes on to Mercedes and Hamilton and whatever. And when Vettel's there free to win in Spa, surely the team wouldn't have done what it did in Monza and end up you know, having the wrong cars on the wrong track at the wrong time. And the momentum's in a completely different place. That one small error, seemingly thrown the whole thing into a tailspin, probably coupled with the, with the timing of, of Marchionia's unfortunate passing, to make it all unwind. And it's like everything has conspired to end up where it is now. Every little error has been magnified and amplified in a way that isn't happening uh, to Hamilton and to uh, Mercedes. Like, Hamilton's hardly driving faultlessly. He's driving brilliantly, but not faultlessly. But the little error he made in qualifying in Sochi, for example, had absolutely no consequence. A little error um, Vettel makes in qualifying, or the team makes, well, there was a little error, it was a big error putting them out on the wrong tyre, has enormous consequences. So everything is being magnified, and that's what's led to what was once a brilliant yo-yo championship being a total cakewalk um, for, Alon, uh, for Hamilton now. You know, we were here talking about it being one of the great all-time championships. It's difficult to see it being remembered that if he's going to win it by 100-odd points, which is quite possible you know he could win easily win the remaining four races and end up way over 100 points ahead. Yeah, yeah Hamilton seems to have everything by the throat now doesn't he this this title race and I guess the the inverse impact of what you're talking about is that Mercedes and Hamilton winning a few races against form or unexpectedly because of Ferrari's mistakes just galvanizes them more and and the pressure drips away from them and they feel as if they can do no wrong. Mm. We talk about sport as being increasingly marginal gains, all sorts of sports they like to talk about marginal gains. I think we'll look at this championship as one that Ferrari booted into the long grass through marginal losses. Yeah I think marginal losses is a good way of looking at it. I think the I love sort of um, being able to have sports and analogies for, that cross pollinate from one to the other. And I think what's happening with Vettel in the second half of the season, it's a bit like what's happening with Mo Salah in Liverpool this season. You know, I can do some amazing, amazing runs and beat three people, but the final shot is ballooning over the bar or isn't quite going to feet in the same way that everything was happening earlier on. And that's the same thing as Vettel at the beginning of the season. Those qualifying laps were coming off, the overtaking moves were coming off. Now, it's, it's only millimetres away from brilliance, but it ends up looking like, you know, it's completely awful, much like a balloon shot over the bar. You know, no matter how many people you've beaten, it's the end product that you're judged by. Yeah, and what did you make of Vettel in, in Japan? Because obviously he was out of position at the start based on Ferrari's error in qualifying. We had a great first lap, made some brave and decisive moves on the lower runners, and then he came across Max Verstappen, which is always yeah. a, a difficulty for any driver, and had a clash, spun to the back, essentially ruined his race. So. Vettel's mindset, his judgment in those situations, what did you make of that? Well, I've seen, uh, listened to a few things and I've read a few things and people said, you know, what was he thinking? There was a five second penalty, blah, blah, blah. But that's the mindset he should have been in two races ago. He was literally in win or bust mode now and there was nothing to be gained from being in third place and whatever. The only way he had any chance of keeping well, that championship Well, a few extra points to, to be gained. Yeah, a bit irrelevant. The, champion, the championship's gone. The only way he can get that championship back on track is to win that race. And the only way he can win that race is to put any form of pressure possible onto Mercedes. And waiting behind Verstappen until the pit stops doesn't put them on any pressure. In fact, it takes all the pressure off. There's a small gap there. 
I don't, I can see why he felt he had to go for it. And I don't necessarily think Verstappen was massively in the wrong, but if that's the way you want to play, and that's the way Verstappen had two choices, right? He can either leave that room, because where Vettel is, he's right on the you know, wheel on the white line. He's not drifting out. He's not like understeering out of him. He has a choice to either take a little bit of lock off and, ro- and let the two of them go through the corner or risk a crash. And he chose to risk the crash, similar as he did with uh, Kimi earlier on in the race. And that ultimately sent Vettel tumbling. But I think he had to go for it to have any chance of putting that pressure instantly on Mercedes, having a way to play the undercut or some way of influencing what was going on in Mercedes' head. He had to go for that move. Uh, Can I be really boring and agree with that? Because (laughs) uh, we see a lot of criticism of of Vettel, particularly his decision-making just there, based on what was known at the end of the race, which was that Verstappen challenged Bottas for second place quite strongly and Bottas was, was struggling a little bit. But really, we should look at what the the decisions Vettel made based on the information he had at the time. And he knew that his only chance of meaningfully putting pressure on Mercedes was to pass Verstappen right there. There was no question of sitting and waiting until lap 20-something for this penalty to kick in. By which time the Mercedes, for all he knew, could be well up the road and out of reach. So he had to pass then. I think his only crime, if, if, if... anything was to overestimate the grip he was going to get from his front axle. Do you think that Vettel has, has checked out on this championship? Do you think that that drive was born of that change in attitude? And do you think Ferrari has a similar attitude given they didn't swap Kimi and Sebastian around at the end of the race? I think Vettel knew it was effectively a final throw of the dice and that, you know, win or bust. Um, and clearly Ferrari has checked out of the championship, otherwise they would have engineered that swap of positions at the end for Kimi and, and Vettel. I mean, even if there's only two points, if you, if you want to give yourself any hope, you do that, they know that this is a completely lost cause. So 2019, if Ferrari has checked out already with several races ago, how do they go about rebuilding for 2019 and coming back at Mercedes trying to wrest that championship from Hamilton's grasp? Not doing more of the same, I think, is the key, but there's already signs that there's power struggles going on behind the scenes. There's talk of discord between uh, Mattia Bonotto and Morris arrives well, and that's not going to end well. Uh, Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I I think um, it's a worrying sign the way the team seems to be fighting against itself now when what they really need to be doing, it's all right to write off this season, but regroup and refocus and, you know, they made big steps over last season to this season and there was definitely a point when they had the best car and the best engine. I think that uh, the way the FIA changed the sensors probably ultimately robbed them of the outright um, quickest package. And I think Merck's clearly got the best one now. But what they need to be doing is focusing on that and how they arrive at the first Grand Prix of next season and to win it on pace and not just a strategic fluky call that they had this year. Um, having a new driver in the team, I think, will um, revitalise that part of the garage. But is that going to be enough? I highly doubt it. You know, if they don't get everything lined up, then they run the risk of suffering a sixth straight defeat to Mercedes. And then another year in waiting, I would argue, is probably you'll see Red Bull Honda package come together then. They might be bumped for even further down the pecking order. So it's a massive winter for them now. And if they're not all pulling together, then they're not going to be in a better position next year, no way.